do what God's going to do tonight. If you're here this morning, you found out that he's already in the mood of doing the supernatural things. And uh, tonight, we are going to sing a song. I'm in where we're from, Rocky Mount, Virginia. Everybody sort of takes these things this way, or a lot of folks do. And that makes us feel at home when we're at home. And we're starting to feel at home around here. Some folks have enjoyed, some have enjoyed, some have tolerated, some have been greatly blessed by this type of music. So uh, what we're going to try to do is uh, do a front line of the title song of the six of these albums tonight in one medley. That should be quite a task. We'll change gears a few times, especially for the drummer over there. He needs to know what key we're in. <laughs> and after church tonight, you will be able to see uh, any one of these, or all six of these, who have enough left that uh, we couldn't short change nobody. So uh, here goes. Now you can find storage plans to pay you when you're ill. And if you're earthly to hold to find a new one, they will fill. And so it's time to open well your silver and your gold. Don't overlook it, throw it on your soul. It's just beyond the grave, protector on your soul. When sin so past your living in, the hands of death may close. Your policy may break your friends. What have you got if you are not in the beyond the grave? There's a house in the blue valley where I used to live one day, and the walls are swiftly falling to decay, and the yard is filled with the souls and the was a rod is so that the storm speed in a lonely night and day. So the spirit came and told me of a wonderful abode where from sin to rain I find a savory tree. So the Savior brought you to the van and took me up the road. In my little house on Hallelujah Street. I see a breeze, oh, it is the arms of cover and sky. I'm not fond, I'm not strong, and many things I've done the wrong. And my heart is burning down in trouble to see. There's a night so dark and long. Oh, how peaceful is the dawn. I see a breeze to wait a song of trouble and sigh. When the valley I must cross is so dark. I used to say, be it all the time. 
and also the gift, of the, seminar, uh, the gift of the Spirit seminar. Some of the folks have been signing up for We're going to mail it to you as soon as we get home. You'll be getting it directly. And this is a study, an in-depth study on the operation of the gift of the Spirit taken at one of our seven seminars that we've conducted the past three years in the organization. As a matter of fact, this is the latest seminar. It was done in June in the state of Virginia at Brother Kelly's church, who is the superintendent of the district church. For all the ministers who attended, we had a grand time. 18 hours of non-stop, jam-packed teaching on operations of the gifts of the Spirit, a subject that we must know much about. How many believes you need to know more? I think some of you uh, will get a few extra...
credit toward your graduation into the kingdom of God after you pass this course. And it's a $30 offering, and that's pretty reasonable. That's like two and a quarter or two fifths of a tape, uh, 12 90 minute tapes in here. And if you have to go together with a few fellow students to get the seminar, uh, tip in. See that you get it, and I'm sure the Lord will teach you much. Hallelujah. Amen. Most of everything that's taught is condensed and uh, jam-packed and it's sort of like dehydrated. It needs to add a little water to it and it just keeps expanding. Some of the statements will dawn on you tomorrow. Go to two. If I, this is your last chance to order because this is our last night to be here. And are you glad you came tonight? Well... Now I'm feeling a lot better because I'm getting ready to go into the area of the meeting that I love the best, what the Lord is going to do. I think if we change the order of the service tonight by standing and praising the Lord for 60 seconds, we'll be very pleased and happy to see that the order will change. God will take us to a higher level now as we glorify his name. Hallelujah to God. Blessed be God. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Is my friend and true to the end? Who gave himself to redeem us, Jesus, my wonderful Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah to God. Oh, Rabbi Man, Thank God, thank God, thank God. I glorify him tonight because he's worth it. Praising my Jesus. Oh, find him. Go with the God. While you're still standing, I'd like to read to you a portion out of the Old Testament. It's found in First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. As Chronicles 4, 9, and 10. And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I have, because I fear him with sorrow. Jabez called on the Lord God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed. Everybody say, Bless me indeed. And enlarge my coast, say, Enlarge my coast. That thine hand might be with me, so thine hand be with me. That thou wouldest keep me from evil, so keep me from evil. That it may not grieve me, so grieve me not. And God granted him that which he requested. I thank you, Jesus, for the reading of this word, may be rich and powerful, sharper than any two of its soul. First down to the dividing of the of soul and spirit and joints of marrow. And be a designer tonight of the thoughts and the influence of every heart in the building. Cause every person that's here tonight to be totally freed from everything that would bind them and lodge against them. Now, for answers that are arising, we thank you. We take power and authority over every demon spirit that does not dare to walk into the building, but is rather on the outside at the, at the parking lot, shaking with his knees, knocking together, afraid of what God will do here tonight. We send them out of the parking lot and back to the pit. And as far as this congregation is concerned, we take authority over every human spirit in the building that they may be brought under subjection to the very Christ, every thought brought into captivity to Christ. I thank you for answers that are arriving by the moment. Amen and amen. Seated as you may be. It was an endless genealogy, this book of Chronicles. The Chronicles of the Kings, and we got bogged down in the first, second chapter, and in the third chapter, and even into the fourth chap chapter up into the ninth verse, of hearing about all these various offspring of offspring, and the son of this, and the son of that, and the son of somebody else, and after a while, it got sort of boring. But suddenly we reached the passage that was different. Suddenly we discovered a man his name was Jabez, that was not status quo. He was not uh, just an ordinary facsimile. This man was different. 
Glory to God. A little treble and a little volume, please. I'm a little bit different tonight than I was last night. But the way I found to myself. All right, I'm starting to get there now. Glory to God. Happy? Stop. Right. See you right on the button. Amen. Grab a newspaper. Hallelujah. Well, I'm happy. Jabez was different. He wasn't just an ordinary saint, an ordinary offspring, part of an ordinary genealogy. I'm glad that you and I are the offspring of God, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ. I know we're co-workers with him. I know we're special. We're kings and priests unto God. We're a holy priesthood, a royal habitation, a spiritual house with lively stones all fit together, working on the building. I think that we can be exceptional, especially if we dare to call ourselves apostolic. God has said in the church, first apostles. What does that mean? The best thing God ever put in the church, the first thing he ever put in the church was apostles, secondarily prophets. Then the Levites were fourthly pastors, fifthly teachers. After that, miracles and healing, helps and government, diversities of tongues. I suppose after that, elders and bishops and superintendents and overseers and general overseers and general superintendents and board members and members, not quite the board. Deacons and deacons that are head deacons and deacons that are head and on and on it goes. God is not fussy who he's put in the church. Take a look around and see who's here tonight. But if you'd like to attain the highest level of what God has for his church, let's try to be apostolic. It's the first thing he ever stuck in the church. Say <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, come on. Where's the Jabezes tonight that want to come out of the ordinary and begin to attain and excel and climb higher and begin to gain altitude in God? Hallelujah. It's not just an ordinary person that is out of the ordinary in God. It seems like there's a price tag to everything you get from heaven. You can take anything you want out of Sears if you pay for it. If you're a thief, and a thief and a robber cannot climb up some other way, you must come in at the door. His name is Jesus. You're wondering why the preacher bends his ear. He listens for a response. Again tonight, amen, oh me, oh my, one of them will fit you. Microphone is portable. We can come down and pick out the quiet spot and preach if we have to. There's no cord on the microphone, which means nobody in the building can escape us this evening. What happy thought. Oh, there's a God. Yes, out of the ordinary, hmm. he was more honorable than his brethren. Well, let's get some honor. Now, ye are those who do seek honor from men, Jesus said to the Pharisees, and you do not seek the honor which is from God only. I believe we should be more honorable on our word of honor, be more honorable than we've been. If you want to excel and be out of the ordinary and different from this uh, run-of-the-mill human being running up and down the sidewalk, I mean, like to be different than the run-of-the-mill human who is running to the mill today. Hallelujah. All right? Be more honorable. God's got to have something to start with. He needs something to begin with. He needs five loaves and two fishes to multiply them. He needs a blind eye to open one. He needs a deaf ear to unstop one. He needs something to do something with. He needs you to bless you tonight. He needs you to do your best so he can do the rest. After you have done your very best and your best righteousness is filthy right, come to what then I won't even bother. You better bother because if you don't do your best, his righteousness will not kick in. I said the appropriation of God's righteousness for your righteousness will not take any effect upon you until you've done your utmost dead level best. Then, after you've done your best and it's not good enough, God will take over from there. Hello. Is it right? Glory to God. More honorable than the rest of his brother. And so let us begin to raise our standards and begin to raise our uh, position and... Uh, don't just follow the world because they'll take you down a broad and winding way. The straight and narrow path is the only one that leads to life. So you may have to cut off a few things leading to life. Lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset you. Now you have to lay aside your sin. That's a foregone conclusion. But the weight will hold you down and pull you back and you lose the race. So you better cut them off too. Then he runs the race at Paul. Only one wins the race. You better run like you intend to win, for you cannot be crowned unless you strive lawfully. So we find that not only does sin have to go, but the weight has got to go. 
They may not be fit, but they hold you back. Hello? More honorable than all his brethren, for his brother bore him in sorrow. All among the brethren, we need a little more honor, and we need a little bit more sorrow. Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He never laughed in the presence of men, except one time he rejoiced. That's the only time ever recorded he rejoiced. And in that hour he rejoiced in spirit and said, Father, I thank you that you've hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and you've revealed them unto babes. A lot of the mouths of babes and sufferings thou hast perfected praise tonight. Let's get the perfect praise going. What do you say? Except you become as a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. A little child shall leave them. Of such are the kingdom of heaven. Oh, come on, all you babes in Christ. How wonderful. And you can grow up. I didn't say not to laugh or be joyful. But there's times there's got to be some sorrow there. It's a price-paying time. It's a cost-bearing time. It's denying yourself time. It's dying daily time. Salvation is free. And it thrills you through and through. But when you do the work of Jesus, then you will have to pay as a price. It'll cost you much. And sometimes sorrow, travail, groaning, agonizing, bursting, and going through the very hour of temptation and the valley of the shadow of death and the hour of decision and rising triumphantly above it. Come on, you honorable people. Be willing to be sorrowful once in a while. It's good. Very hard. That's good like a medicine. But sorrow. And weeping abideth only for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Hallelujah. You might be happy. If you'd like to be a whole lot happier, get sorrowful first. And then the great joy in the morning will be more intense joy than you've ever had before. Say hallelujah. Thirdly, he called on God. I believe we're going to call on God tonight. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord should be saved, healed, delivered, set free, devil cast out. The devil is scared of that name. Believe it says, One God, thou doest well. The devils also believe, and they fear, and they tremble. There's no other name in the heaven among men whereby you must be saved. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of God. Now let's call upon that uh, name of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that before you even call, said the Lord, I will answer. God knows what you have need of before you can even ask. Hallelujah. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above anything you could ever ask or think. You have not because you ask not. If you have not received anything yet, it's probably because you haven't opened your lips and asked for it, made petition. You haven't decreed it. You haven't sought God for it. If you've already asked for it and haven't got it yet, ask again. Somebody said, knock and it shall be opened. How long shall I knock? Until it is open. How long shall I seek? Until you do find. Uh, how long shall I ask? Until you do receive. Don't ever quit. So many times people are run out of a meeting like this five seconds before they're going to get a miracle. Hallelujah. Don't work all week at the factory and forget to pick up your check on Friday. Hello? That means after this service tonight or during the service at some point, you should pick up your check or rather receive your miracle for the efforts you made by being here and worshiping this evening. Hallelujah to God. But well, I love it. Are you happy? All right, we are looking at a man more honorable, a man who is willing to be sorrowful, a man who is willing to call on God for what he needs, not relying on his own understanding, but calling on God. And when he calls, here's what he began to ask for. He didn't ask for wealth and fame. Like Solomon, when God asked him, uh, he gave him an offer, he said, ask anything you want and I'll give it to you. Solomon didn't ask for the life of his enemies. He didn't ask to be a big shot and have all kind of money. And ask for power to do this, that, and the other for his own end. He said, I'm a child. I can't lead you people. Help me to know how to lead, guide, and direct them. So give me wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Jabez was the same thing. Jabez says, oh, bless me, Lord. Bless me indeed. Now, there's a difference between being blessed and indeed being blessed indeed. Would you like to be blessed indeed tonight? Indeed, let us be blessed. I just don't want to be blessed. I want to be blessed indeed. And if you're going to get the extra blessing, the double blessing, the triple portion blessing, the exceeding and abundantly above anything you could ask or think blessing, you may have to ask and call on God for it. I want to be blessed indeed, and then when I start performing deeds, I want the deeds to be blessed. 
I want God to bless us in deed, in deed, work, accomplishment here tonight. Hallelujah. Oh, bless me in deed. Enlarge the place of my coat. I may like to have some enlargement. For God's conclusion, there are some folks that's going to get a blessing for the asking tonight. Other people need to be enlarged. Their coast is too small. I'm going to get to the New Testament counterpart of this in just a second. I'm talking on a man in the Old Testament. I'll be referring to a woman in the New Testament so that men and women can both feel filled in and not left out. Neither male nor female should be excluded tonight from a message. But there's something for everybody. Enlarge the place of my coat. Why, most folks have two by four thinking. Starvation mentality. Too narrow in their view of God and what he's able to do. They have managed to repent and be baptized and sit of the Holy Ghost and they're warming that old pew and nest egg from now to Jesus comes. Too narrow. Enlarge my coat. Expand me. Set forth the habitation of thy stakes and large thy habitation and begin to make God bigger than what he's sent to you in the past. Oh, thank God. You have not because you ask not. But if, James said, you're going to ask, ask largely that your joy might be filled. Uh, people who believe God for headaches and toe aches, let's ask God for bigger miracles, creative miracles. Let's get on the perimeter and break through the border of the supernatural and the creative. That which you can see happening with your naked, natural eyes. Hallelujah. Enlarge the place of my coat. And while you're enlarging me, please don't let me coast. Say amen. And let thine hand be with me. You want the hand of God to be with you tonight? Now when this old preacher lays these old hands on some of your old heads here tonight, he's going to pray for dear life that God is with his hand. Let thine hand be with me. Let thine hand be with my hand. I believe our hand is in the hand tonight, and if you feel a nail scar in the hand that you just stabbed, bless the sword, you've got the right thing. You haven't got a wrong spirit. You're in the very right atmosphere, regardless of what you think about this church and uh, the folks around here and their doctrine and everything else. If there's a nail scar in the hand that you're reaching, you got the right Jesus. Hallelujah. You want God's hand to be with us tonight? When it comes time to pray for you, you want to hope that there's something in these hands. And there will be because we preach the word. But I don't like preaching. I just want to be prayed for and go home. I want to hurry up and get it over with. I've got two minutes, God. Can you bless me in two minutes? Hallelujah. Don't preach too much holiness to me because I just want to be healed so I can sin without pain. Hello. Now it's true, God will heal a sinner, but then he'll say sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. You think it's all God, everything, and you nothing? You have a little obligation. Sometimes you have to make a little sacrifice. Sometimes you may have to revamp your thinking and replan your life. Hallelujah to God. Let thine hand be with me. Let not evil come upon me. Deliver me from evil. Aren't you glad that in an evil day and generation, evil does not have to come near your dwelling, come nigh your door, come upon your body, live in your family, rise up on the roof of your house. God can keep you from all the evil. Jesus said, the prince of this world cometh, but he hath nothing in me. Is that nothing on me? I haven't done nothing that he can accuse me of. He hasn't got anything to come against me concerning. Therefore, the old boy can't touch me. He's water off a duck's back. He can't make me sick. He can't make me feel bad. He can't condemn me. He can't aggravate me. He can't torment me. He can't oppress me. He's got nothing on me. He's a coming. You can't stop him from coming. But he ain't got nothing on me. Nothing in me either. Hallelujah. Oh, keep me from evil. Let it not grieve me. I believe it's time to get over our grieving. There are people here tonight that are still grieving over the dead. God wants you to quit grieving over the departed because you can't bring them back. You can only go to them. Start enjoying the living because they're the ones that need to get ready to go where the dead have already gone to. 
Hallelujah to God. There are people that are easily grieved. They are so weak that if you look at them cross-eyed, they don't remember to shake their hand, they get so grieved. Hallelujah. Some people are haunted by their memories. All they can think of is the past and all the horrible things that's happened to me. Quit your grieving. Quit your mule face religion. Get your smile on right side up. It takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. Smile and give your face a rest. Hallelujah, thank God. Don't grieve anymore. Also, the Spirit of God is easily grieved. Nothing grieves the Spirit of God any more than grieving the saints. God does want you happy. And someone said, oh, I thought you said you wanted us sorrowful, like Jabez. Well, every time you become sorrowful, you get more happy when the sorrow is over. Hallelujah. But why be sorrowful? Because there's a time for everything beneath the face of the sun. There's a time to weep and there's a time to laugh. There's a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to live, a time to die. A time to gather stone, a time to throw away stone. There's nothing left after humanity. Once humanity's gone off the face of the earth, all your works are dross and they've been burned up as a vestige. I shall fold them up. They shall all wax go. Their cancer dissolve and disintegrate into oblivion. Everything goes back to the dust, back into the invisible spirit of God where it sprung out of to start with. Materialism in this realm as we know it all came out of God. The world's were framed by the word of God. So that everything made is not made out of what it looks like it's made out of. Is that what the Bible says? But it's not made what it appears to be made out of. That appears to be made out of wood, but it was really made out of the word of God. But when God's word spoke out of God's own presence and essence himself, out of his invisible spirit, came visible, solidified particles of matter and formed out of the new truth. Now, scientists have never been able to create matter. They can never destroy it. They change it chemically from form to form to form, but they can't make no new. They can't get rid of any of the old. Only God is the creator who can create matter. Why is he doing it? Because he's allowed so many molecules to materialize out of himself. <laughs> One day he's going to take them all back again. You won't see them in this material world anymore, but you'll see them on the other side in the supernatural realm because nothing can dissolve, nothing can really die. It's only metamorphosis. Your soul cannot perish. It just leaves the carcass. The carcass disappears and you show up in the other world. There's a real you and then there's this outside banana skin. Hallelujah. Are you listening? Don't worry about the furniture in heaven if they happen to disappear down here. Elijah and Elisha are sitting on the same sofa right now. One went in a fiery chariot in his glorified body, and the other one fell sick of the sickness whereof he died, and the same chariot showed up to his deathbed, and the king, Joash, saw the chariot, saying, My father, my father, the horsemen of Israel, and the chariot thereof, and Elisha just got up out of his old sick corpse, and his spirit jumped in the chariot. He went to the same heaven Elijah went to. And they're talking together right now, one in the glorified body and one in the spirit. Oh, yes, they took Elijah's dead bones and buried him, and they threw a, a man that was dead, died on the battlefield, in on top of those dead, dry bones. And the minute that that old corpse hit the dead bones of Elijah, he revived and stood upon his feet and ran out of the sepulchre, proving that Elijah had more power in his dead bones than most you folks sitting here tonight were alive once. Hallelujah to God. Oh, don't you want some power in your bones? Let it not grieve me. I believe God's not going to let you grieve tonight, and you're not going to grieve God either tonight. And you know what? God granted him that which he requested. I believe we're rapidly reaching a moment in the final night of this day where you will rapidly begin to receive the thing that you request. Because you're asking after God's own heart. You're asking after God's own will. You're asking after God's own mind and desire. The Bible tells us if we know that if we ask anything according to his will, you hear about us. Sometimes you have not, because not just because you ask not, but because you ask the miss to consume it upon your own love. It's an error. 
But if you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will, and it shall be done. You believe that if you abide in Christ and God's word abides in you, you will not be asking erroneously? How could you not ask but for what the mind of God was, or the mind of Christ was, if you was in him and his word was in you? Now when you ask us anything according to his will, we have this confidence, that he heareth us. But when you ask something that pleases the heart of God, he will grant you that request. It is God's will in the end time to show his healing power. He does not want the hospitals and the medical profession to have a monopoly upon the human carcass. Anyone gets a monopoly, they will not allow you out until you pay the very last farthing. They'll take you for a ride. You'll be the rest of your life paying back the doctor that killed you. Half of your organs missing, you only live half of your life. Hallelujah. God wants the church to start healing the sick so there'll be a viable alternative in this country as to how to get delivered. And if we don't stay ahead of this high-tech society in the Holy Ghost realm, we will miss the whole generation and never catch their attention. We'll blow it. So we've covered the Old Testament Jabez here who received everything he asked for. And I'm going to ask God tonight to give us everything that he asked for. Hallelujah. And God never held one thing back from the five petitions that he made. Five is the number of the ministry. As I already mentioned it. Pastors, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And so I say tonight that when old Jabez comes along and says, Bless me, enlarge me, keep your hand upon me and with me. Use my hands by your hand. Keep me from evil. Don't let it come on me. And don't let me be grieved. God is so happy about people who pray that kind of a prayer. He does it for them. The Diophanesian woman was also on a coast that was being large. She was a woman. She was in the New Testament. One day, she who lived on the coast of Canaan decided that she had coasted long enough. She was on the circumference. She was on the perimeter. She was outside of what God was really doing. But as she lived out on the coast, she never realized that deep was in the heartland of the land of Galilee. Jesus Christ of Nazareth was performing signs, wonders, and miracles, and he was developing upon the earth the kingdom of God. She's out here on her back porch and in her rocking chair, oblivious to what's going on around her, living out on the coast of Canaan. If you are a Canaanite, a true Canaanite, and want to possess the Canaan's land, please get off the coast. Get off the stool, do nothing. Get off the circumference. You haven't scratched the surface yet of what God has prepared for his people. Hallelujah. She'd have always been in the mess, but she was in a shallow, superficial Christian life, so to speak. Except her daughter got demons of that. Don't let sorrow come to me. Well, I don't mind it as long as joy comes in the morning. More joy than you've ever had before. She's been everywhere to the lawyers and the liars. To the doctors and the physicians. She's been to the actors and the chiropractors. She'd been down to the psychologist and the psychiatrist, and one week she was so dismayed because she couldn't find her psychiatrist. He was out seeing his psychiatrist. There was no hope whatsoever for her daughter, but she heard about Jesus. She knew it would take about a hundred mile journey on her little old dusty feet, but she said, I'm going to be so desperately determined. I'm going to be different than the status quo. I'm not going to be like the routine genealogy. I'm not just going to be like some other average, ordinary Christian, a saint or ain't. I am on my way to find him. She made the journey. And the first night of five nights, she came in a New Testament determination, petitioning the Lord of glory. Son of David, have mercy on me, my daughter is previously vexed with the devil. And Jesus answered her, You are correct. Not a word. Not a word did he answer. But she said, I don't care. I feel like I'm making progress. I didn't hear anything on the first night of the meeting, but I'll be back. Some people come to the meeting one night, but they don't get everything that they feel that God's obligated to dump on them. You'll never see them no more. Hallelujah. She 
said, I'll be back tomorrow night. The second night she came and said, Son of David, have mercy upon me. My daughter's given to the of the devil. She did not change her tune, nor her plan, nor her petition. Oh, I'm so glad she hung in there. I knew a friend of mine who prayed for all the missionaries, all the pastors, all the evangelists. Everybody he could think of. Ever could tell anything ever happened. One day he started praying specifically, and he began receiving specifically. He was able to follow the exact petition of his prayer. He wasn't off the track. He knew what she wanted. How many knows what you want tonight? Jesus did not speak to her the second night, but the disciples did. They said, get out of here. She fly. Don't bother me. Get her out of here, Jesus. She's crying after us. Send her away. Now, before Pentecost, the disciples were professionals at driving people away from Jesus. I guess they wanted him all to themselves. But after Pentecost, they were professionals at bringing people to Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. She always kept a diary, and the night she wrote down, I made progress. Last night, he spoke not to me. He did not look at me. I got nothing, but I uh, felt like I was making some progress. I felt an urge to return, but tonight I'm making more progress than I know for sure because he noticed me. I started crying, and the disciples shooed me away and drew me to his attention. Now I know that he noticed me. Now Jesus knows you there the first time. He knows all about you. He knows the name of the, uh, your name, zip code, telephone number, the number of the hair on the top of your head. There's nothing about you he don't know. But you're going to get to the place where you know that he knows it. It was the second night the Syrophoenician woman in her determination in the New Testament to receive from God the desire of her heart looked upon him who did not speak to her. But she knew that he had seen her because the disciples pointed her out saying, look at that cry, baby. She's crying after us. She said, I'm making progress. And in my diary, I write this truth. If you will learn to cry, you will get his attention. When is the last time you shed a few tears? I said, it's time some you start crying again. You hear that old hard heart. Was Jabez a man of sorrows before he was a man of double joy? And in sorrow, he cried, cried. He said, you know, from now on, I think I'll do some more crying. A broken heart and a contrite spirit, God will not despise, but he saveth such. Weeping again, laughs but for a night, joy comes in the morning. Hallelujah. I'll be back. Third night of the meeting. Son of David, have mercy on me. I know what you're going to say, said Jesus. Your daughter's grievously vexed to the devil, cast out the devil from your daughter. I hate to tell you this, little sister, but I'm not sent, but onto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, diggity dog, shouted the sign of an Eastman. He spoke to me. Hello? Aren't you glad God is speaking to you tonight? He's speaking to you by the Holy Ghost. He's declaring his word on to you. You that want to hear what you want to hear, thank your lucky stars that you're hearing anything. He said, he told me everything I didn't want to hear, but I'm so thrilled he's even talking to me. Maybe this preacher hasn't preached what you want to hear preached yet. Maybe he's preached a few things that's getting next to your skin. Something bothering you. You don't like that kind of preaching. Just thank God he's even preaching to you. Just thank God for the preaching anyhow. He said, I'm going to work that phrase and sentence and clause for everything I can get out of it. What did he say again? I am She's still writing in her diary, writing about the I am. I am not who my. If I can just get the knots out, said she. I am not sent. Thank God he sent to somebody. You go ahead. I am not sent, but, but, oh, only goat, but, call off my horns and make me a sheep too. Hallelujah. I know I ought to go to the meeting, but, I should get healed, but, I should live right, but, only goats, but. Come on, you sheep, say, bah, bah. Hallelujah. You need to get your nature changed and become a new creature. You sheep, you should know his voice by now. I am not sent but to the lost. 
Ooh, if I could just get lost. The fellow told me, he said, you know, Brother Brady, I found the Lord last week. I said, I never knew he was lost. You was lost, and he found you. You're not chosen me, I've chosen you and ordained you. That he might go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, it shall be done. <laughs> I am not sent but to the lost. Father told me one time, said, Now, brother, I used to be a goat. I became a new creature, now I'm a sheep, I'll never be a goat again. I knew what he was saying, you know, he was trying to promote that doctor. Oh, the city cows used to believe, you know, once in grass, always in grass. Please don't read between the lines. I said, brother, now, it's true that if you live like the devil, you live with the devil. You can overcome it. God will not block his name out of the Lamb's Book of Life, showing that once it's there, it could be blotted out. Hello. Right on the plane with a guy one time, and he tried for an hour to explain that, and when he's all done, he's frustrated, he just smashed his teeth and said, I don't know the answer to it. Surprisingly, to win his soul, I agreed with him. I said, now, brother, you're right. Out of your sheep, you probably will never be a goat again. Why, Brother Freddy, I'm surprised that you agree with him. And I went on to further add, however, if you're not careful, you may die a lost sheep. Hmm? Were there 99 in the fold when one was lost and Jesus had to leave him in the wilderness to go find the lost one? If he'd have found it, if he hadn't have found it, it would still have been a sheep, it would have been a dead one, a dead sheep. Now you know why the rest of us wind up in the wilderness so many times. He leaves 99% of the congregation in the wilderness to go catch that crazy tangent, that fellow that ran off there somewhere that's got no business running off but belongs in the sheepfold. Every time you run off from the sheepfold, you hold the rest of us up. You hinder the rest of us. The congregation cannot make the progress it needs before God Almighty. Miriam murmured against her brother Moses, and God smote her with leprosy. And Aaron jumped up, oh, pray for her now, heal her now, Moses. So Moses said, I'll try. And Moses said, God, heal her now. God said, I won't heal her now. If her father but spit in her face, should she not be on clean seven days? Stick her outside the camp. She went outside the fold. She went outside the camp. She was out there in the wilderness herself now, and the Bible said that the whole congregation of Israel could not travel for seven days. For one solid week, she held them up and held up progress. Hello? I said, you better do what it takes to stay in the fold, because we need to make progress around here. Say hallelujah! Whoa! But I'm happy. I am not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Oh, if I could just get in the house. And my friend, if you are a child of faith, then you're Abraham's seed. The children of Abraham. But Abraham kept circumcision. Oh? Sorry, but the Bible said Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. That's faith. But what about the circumcision? It was only because he believed God that he ever subjected himself to suffer in the flesh. If you don't believe in what you're doing, you won't suffer for it. His belief, his faith came first. Oh, hallelujah. Abraham was uh, 86 years old when he had a son of the flesh, Ishmael. He got ahead of God like most folks do. 14 years later, and 14 is the double portion number because it's seven twice, twice seven, seven's God's number, and doubled is the double portion number. Who needs a double portion from God? That made him 100 years old, and when he became 100%, then he had a son of the Spirit. As a matter of fact, he still had a little life when he was 84 years old, and that's why he was in the plague. But when he got to be 100 years old, he was the day he couldn't have a child, so God had the child for him. 
I say unto you, if you want the Son of the Spirit to start operating in your life tonight, go ahead and let God do it for you and quit trying to do it on your own and through your own effort. Hallelujah. Oh, praise my God. I'm not saying, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, aren't you glad you're in the house? Now, the servant abideth not in the house forever, Jesus said, but the son abideth forever. But you want to be sons instead of servants. I used to read about the love slave there in the Old Testament, how he stuck the hole in his ear and punched the all to the door and promised to serve his master. I think we've served our time as slaves. I believe we've served our time as servants. I think the highest form of Christian wit and life and walk is to be a son of God. Brother, now are we the sons of God. Let's not appear what we shall be, but when he shall appear, we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. You know the difference between a servant and a son? Servants don't belong in the house forever, but the son abideth in the house forever. What's the difference between a servant and a son? The servant does not know what his Lord is doing, Jesus said, but the son knows. You know, a lot of people serving God don't have a clue what God's doing. But the son of God knows what his Lord is doing. The son knows. Hallelujah. Is it right? What is a real simple example between a servant and a son? There's the servant on the back door knocking on the screen, please may I have a sandwich? The son walks in the front door and up the steps, kicks the door, slams the screen, stomps across the kitchen floor, opens the fridge, and makes his own sandwich. Father, uh, dad looks out the, the, the bedroom window and just shakes his head and says, son, he's got another hollow leg to bed. He's putting the groceries away. Is there anything I can do about it? Because he belongs in the house. He's a son. He's in the family. He's got the bloodline in him. Looks like I'm just going to have to pay the grocery bill. Say amen. The son abideth forever. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel good. Servant does not abide forever, but the son abideth forever. Servant doesn't know what his Lord's doing, but the son knows. Hallelujah. Let us Oh, I'm in the house, she said. I'll be back tomorrow night. On the fourth night of the meeting, she, she came uh, skipping back to the tent crusade, whatever it was. And as she came in, she said, Son of David, have mercy. I know what you're going to say. It's said, Jesus. However, I must tell you that healing is the children's planet. She said, it is. Well, why not think of that? Healing is bread. How many took English in school? They went to school. In English vocabulary, healing is the children's bread would be a sentence. Healing is the subject, is, is the verb, beginning the predicate, right? Healing is, he is an adjective modifying bread, which is a noun in the predicate. That noun in the predicate, bread, is actually a direct object, which makes it uh, synonymous with the subject. In other words, healing is bread. Healing and bread are the same thing. Healing is the children's children, is another adjective modifying bread, a direct object or a noun in the predicate. So what I said was, healing is bread. Proved it to you by English grammar and the way the Jesus spoke the sentence. Healing is bread, or bread is healing. Now she said, I, it dawns on me, I've been asking for healing every night. I think I'll switch tonight and ask for some bread. Since it's the same thing. Come on. Say, come on, preacher, lay the bread on me. I'm tired of running out to this revival just to get my aches and pains healed. I want to hear some bread. Hallelujah. All healing is bread tonight. Glory to God. I haven't come just to see what I can get out of God. I want to hear something from God. Oh, healing the children's bread. He said, I'll tell you what, Jesus. I'll be back tomorrow night and I'll have my wits about me and my priorities today. I'm going to be asking for bread tomorrow night. I've asked for healing all these nights and got none yet. Maybe I should have been listening to the preaching after all. Come on. 
Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. This is that bread that cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Your fathers ate bread on the wilderness and they're dead, but if you eat this bread tonight, you'll live forever. Hallelujah. Oh, thank God. On the fifth and final night, she came back to the crusade, just like the fifth petition of Jabez in the Old Testament, the fifth petition of the Syrophoenician in the New Testament. And she, a woman, came and said, Son of David, I have mercy. I know what you're going to say, said Jesus. And I must tell you, I can't take the children's bread and cast it to a couple of dogs. You and your daughter's a dog. Whoop. Well, that would have been all it took if that had been you. You'd have walked out of that church and slammed that door and kicked that sidewalk and said, I'll never go back and listen to that preacher again. He called me my daughter the dog. What was her attitude? Once more she shouted, Hawk, diggity dog. I'm a dog. I'm so happy to be a dog. I'm so glad I'm exactly what Jesus says I am. I am no longer whom I think I am. I'm exactly what he says I am. God knows more about you than you know about yourself. You might have a pretty high regard for your own personal pedigree, but God knows what you're made out of. He knows your consistency. He said, I've been trying to get in the family for five nights. I finally made it. I'm only the family dog, but I'm in. Now that I know who I am, and I'm willing to be exactly what he says I am. Now, Jesus, I'm going to claim a dog's right. Now that I know that I'm a dog, I'm going to claim the right of a dog. Oh, this crafty woman. This desperately determined Saphonician. This woman that was absolutely after the only source of help possibly that could be offered. Was determined to get what she's after if it did take her five nights. And if it did mean she was going to become a dog, she said, I'll be underneath the table, barking, just as soon as you get a chance to clean mouthfuls, poke one crumb down through the crack, and all it's going to take is one crumb to cast the devil out of my daughter because the crumbs are so potent. Oh, hallelujah to God. The dogs have the right to eat the crumbs. I know a dog's right. Hello. I wonder if you know you're right. I wonder if you even know who you are. I'm trying to tell you that the happiest people in heaven will be the sons and daughters of God. A dog is beneath a slave. From slavery to servitude to sonship. I think we should start climbing the ladder here tonight and find out who we are and claim the rights thereof and heaven and earth can pass away, but his word will never pass away. He cannot withhold any precious promise from you who claim it, who know who you are and can claim the rights of whatever you are. The rights of a son. Hmm, how interesting. Think you know what a son's rights are? Start claiming a few of them and he has to do it for you because the word of God is forever settled. Can't destroy the world. The world can blow up in uh, hydrogen, a atomic, nuclear fission. God's word can never pass away. Hallelujah. Thank my God. Crumbs, he said. Dogs have the right to the crumbs. I saw a sign down the road. I think it was a Kentucky Fried Chicken sign that said, you have a right to have chicken rights. Seems like everybody's clamoring about their rights today. Oh, but the church. Why don't the church claim their rights? Everybody else is trying to. Maybe you don't know who you are yet. Find out who you are and claim the rights, and God promises to give you what belongs to your rights. Hallelujah. A dog eats the crumb. Listen, if a dog can get crumb and crumb can cast out devils, that must be a pretty powerful crumb. Why did Jesus feed 5,000 and pick up 12 basketfuls of crumbs? Because they're so powerful they can cast out devils. You don't have to get a, a hold of a whole lot here tonight to get the devil cast out here. Because these crumbs that we're hanging on to right now, claiming the rights for right now, are so potent and powerful, a little bit goes a long way and little as much when God's in it. All who have despised the day of small things. Hallelujah. I love him. 
first time I saw Lance, it, he was he had dogs licking his sores he couldn't afford to talk to. He was eating crumbs that fell off the rich man's table. But the last time I saw him, he was in Abraham's bosom. You no wonder God don't waste a thing. When God on feet, he's going to pick up every fragment because he can use it all someplace, somehow, somewhere, sometime. The crumbs will take you to heaven, Lazarus. The crumbs will cast out the devil from your daughter, O Saphonation. What will ever happen to you people tonight if you eat the whole loaf? Ooh, I'm going to toss out a few loaves. I hope you can get yours. There's yours. Grab a loaf and gobble it up. Go ahead and chew on it. How do there's a loaf for you, Dad, Granddad, Grandma, Uncle, Aunt, Niece, Nephew, Brother, Sister. Take your loaf and eat it. He that overcome about God, him to eat the hidden man. Tossing out some more hidden man. I don't see nothing, preacher. Of course you don't. It's hidden man. <laughs> I don't taste anything. Ooh. If you don't taste anything, don't let the preacher know. Don't let your neighbor know. It's he that overcome him that gets to eat the hidden man. If you're not tasting anything, we're learning a lot about your overcoming. So if you don't take anything, just carry on like you do. Don't let the rest of us know that we're not an overcomer. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. It tastes like honey in the rock. Brother, we're not full of crumbs here. We got the whole loaf today. Hallelujah. We're sons and daughters. We have a right to the whole loaf, not the crumbs. Jesus shook his head and said, I can't test you anymore, woman. I put you through the mill to the nth degree. There's nothing else I can do. You got me that time. Now I gotta do it. In fact, I don't even have to do it, it's already done. Go on home, the devil's out of your daughter. But 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 Jesus, you've got to pray for me. Mm-hmm. You got to pray over me. Mm-hmm. Lay hands on me. Don't I have to go through a Jericho march or a faith gauntlet or order a flesh shower cap or something? Uh-uh. Get to play, play through me by proxy. No. Oh. Apron? Anointed prayer cloth? Uh-uh. Does you have to walk home with me? Uh-uh. Does you have to see the girl lay hands on her? Uh-uh. What do you have to do, Jesus? Absolutely nothing. It's already done. It's already done. But how did it happen? Why is it already done? Because. You broke through from the coast. You broke into the heartland. Oh, you moved on out in desperate determination. You wouldn't take no for an answer. You persevered and you hung in there and you broke through on your own. And that saved me from having to do anything. You did it on your own through your determination. Hallelujah. There are new levels in the spirit that we need to go through tonight. Uh, spiritual breakthrough. In the Philippian jail that night at midnight when the earthquake came, the jailer almost committed suicide. He was a real prisoner. But the prisoners that were prisoners had gotten saved. Listen to the song and to the praising and the singing and the shouting of Paul and Silas. And when the earthquake came, it set them free. They broke out of jail with the earthquake. For them it was a breakthrough. But for the jailer and his family, it was a holocaust. Catastrophe. And there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Those folks that aren't ready are going to be uh, hearts failing them with fear. But the folks that have prepared their hearts are going to have a breakthrough. And it's not an earthquake after all. It's a breakthrough. I'm just looking for a breakthrough tonight. No matter how much shaking is going on around you, it's a breakthrough. It's not an earthquake. Hallelujah. The fifth night in a row, she was so happy to return home to find the devil out of her daughter. Jesus did not do it for her particularly. She did it on her own by breaking through. Determined, earning, purging, shoving, pressing, pushing. Oh my, what am I telling you today? I'm telling you this, that if you will try harder than you've been trying, the preacher won't have to do much. Well, if this is a really God, Lord, to have Brother Freddy call me out, have him tell me all about it, then I know it's God. Let it be healed and let it clear up, and then 
Uh, if it's exactly right, if it really happens, I'll not a small approval and say a professional amen. Oh, don't try so hard. I said, don't strain yourself, dearie. I really said, come on, you star Phoenicians, get off the coast and break through on your own, and I'll go up here and lay down on the altar rail and take me a nap, and God will still start working healings and miracles and signs and wonders out over this entire congregation. Hallelujah to God. Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. The Sire Phoenician was more determined than all her sisters. Hallelujah to God. And they were out of the ordinary. And they set such an example and a testimony of faith by their effort that they got exactly what they petitioned God for. God granted them what they asked. Hallelujah. Put up your hand and get ready for God to grant you what you're asking for tonight because of your desperate determination. Oh, God, bless them. Expand their coasts and enlarge their borders. Let your hand be on them. Don't let evil come on them. And, oh God, don't let them be grieved by wickedness. Oh Lord God, help them to return if they hear nothing. Come back to church if they hear nothing tonight. Let them learn to cry and get your attention. Oh God, let them even now begin to realize that they are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Maybe they don't hear what they want to hear. But thank God, thanks be to God that they're hearing anything from God tonight. Hallelujah. Let them learn that healing is bread. And not just healing should we seek for, but the bread instead. Hallelujah. Let them find out that they are exactly what God calls them. But when they find out what they are, claim the rights thereof, and they'll have exactly what they need in whatever form that the right includes it in. Hallelujah. Thank God. There's no determination tonight. I see it. Hallelujah. I want to pray the first prayer of faith for souls tonight. Every soul is more determined to be honorable, sorrowful, and to call on God. Every soul that's more determined than ever to be determined to hear him, regardless of what he says, and to be what he says that you are. And so determined that you can help God out instead of all God and ask nothing to do our share. If your soul has not been as determined as Jabez or the Syrophoenician, would you get your soul on your feet right now and let me pray over it so a brand new pack of determination can come down into your spirit so you can become more honorable. You can become a Jabez. You can become more determined. You can become a Syrophoenician. Get off the perimeter. Get deep into the heartland of what God's trying to do in your life. Put up your hand as we pray for souls even now. In the marvelous, matchless, mightiest name of the Christ, let every soul enhance and grow and expand and develop and enlarge and bless it, oh God. Put your hand upon it. Don't let evil hit it. Don't let it be grieved. Oh God, let them hear your voice no matter what you say. May they accept and believe and be thrilled over the reproof or the rebuke, just like the exhortation or the instruction. Hallelujah to God. Let them be what you call them. God, let them become a sheep. Oh, glory to God. Let them claim the rights of who they are and hang on until they get it. Hallelujah to God. Every soul be thou now enhanced in this very building tonight. Recon dream on robable shiki on sky. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Rabban soralabon risakalabi hasnai. Hallelujah to God. Oh, I love him because he first loved me. Everybody go ahead and glorify God one more time. Thank you for his word and for what he did in your soul. Glory to God. Glory to God. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God everlasting Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lord. And I love him now. If you're happy, say thank God I'm happy. Did you receive his word tonight? Let us watch and see what God's word will do for all the recipients in this place. Oh, to God. Hallelujah to God. I love him. Thank God. Hallelujah to God. Praise my God. Hallelujah. Get a grip on yourself. Let him hear God try to work a miracle. And the devil trying to get your mind off of it. Hallelujah. This kid will be all right for a minute. Come, sister. It's you that's going to get the miracle. 
stand in the aisle and God will heal you tonight. We prayed the first prayer of faith for souls. God's done a work. Now we're praying the second prayer of faith for an individual for divine healing in her body. I'm so glad you're going to be healed, sister. Raise your hands higher. We will try to teach as we demonstrate for you that don't know what we're doing because we never got out to the meeting for the last night. We called her out because the word church means by definition we called out once. She may belong to the church after all. She raises her hands because it comes from heaven. She takes a step of faith because it's obedient. And the more you obey God, the deeper you get into God, the more God can do for you. Again, the little sister looks upon me. She looks upon me because the eye is the gate to the soul. She goes to the eye gate and to the soul, and then you see the real need of an evil everything. Now we're going to tell you exactly what God's going to heal you of, okay? You suffered with your spine and your back. That's good? Amen. You're going to get a new one now? Amen. She's in agreement. If just she and I agree, it would be done. The voice of two witnesses is that the word is established. Secondly, you have suffered in your blood. Your blood has been low or tired blood. You recognize tired. That's the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. If you have no life in your flesh, it's because of your blood. That's a scripture. God's going to give you a blood transfusion, sister, because you are borderline anemic. Almost me. Thirdly, it's upon me again. Thirdly, you have had, have had weakness in your female organs of your lower abdomen. You want God to restore these organs for you now? Amen. You want to be down. You have something lodged in your neck, they say. You like it free. You want to go. Right, blowing of the eyes, vision in your eyes. Trying to stop. Now, this is beautiful. You go farther than this. There is a, a cloud, it's like a, a, a perfect cloud, and it hangs over your house, over your home, over your family. God is driving that depression out of your house and off the roof of your house now. You will go home and find great joy and peace as you walk through the door tonight. It hasn't been there before. Hallelujah. You glad about that? Lord, you could have just healed the back. But you wanted to give her everything. And we'd only receive what we ask for. Listen, her thanks. Thank my God is done. Boy. Let the blood rise now. Hallelujah, the transfusion has took. Oh, where they gone. Everybody said, thank God. Walk with me a step of faith. Move your back round and about and see whether there be any pain or stiffness or drawing in your spine whatsoever at this point. What do you feel? Uh, how long have you suffered with your back? Five years. Five years. Would you lean forward now and reach your toes? You did it. Did it hurt you any? Imagine on your lower abdomen to see if you're tender or sensitive. Uh -huh. Ah, if you're not, see the free, weak, and relaxed. Yeah. Turn around and look at the friendly folks waiting to see if anybody looks brighter or clearer or more distinct in any way whatsoever. The friendly ones are waiting. Are they, are they really plainer? Great peace and bring you home. When you go home, you won't feel the heaviness and over the roof. Mm -hmm. Well, thank God. The spirit of confusion was the name of the spirit that was in your home. It's gone now, and you've got your house in order. God is setting your house in order now. 
Hallelujah. Go ahead. You came for God to hear you tonight? Yes. Raise up your hand. You believe he'll do it now? Yes. How many will believe this along with this woman? That's good. You have suffered in your lower stomach. You're here. You're facing surgery. Facing surgery. God is going to give you surgery tonight in the intestinal tract and in your bladder. In your bladder. Be ready. Take another step of faith. You have had minor surgeries before. One time something occurred in your elbow. Your right elbow. God will heal your elbow. You suffer with both your legs. So I stop there and pray for it all. All right. He told me to pray for it all. I could stop. So why bother? If we're only going to get what we ask for, we might as well pray for the whole nine yards. Pray specifically and receive specifically. But then pressure come in your head here. It's like a bright, like migraine attack over your temple. Your eyes will blur from time to time. They blur, and they feel like they're jumping out of the socket. Yeah. You have a tiny lump that catches in your throat here. Miss Brother, yeah. with me, one more thing, it'll probably be a general overhauling. Oh, well, there is one more thing. You have contacted our psychic to the spine. All right? Yeah. Have I spoke to the truth tonight? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have never met before? No. Yeah. You don't know me? No. Yeah. Never talked? No. Yeah. Uh, you didn't sign cards to tell us this? Ah, uh, you see any transmitters in my ears? Must be God, all I know. And God is not the author of confusion. He wouldn't reveal it unless he meant to heal it. And the woman said, we spoke of the truth. The woman at the truth set you free. Woo! upon Blessed be God. Listen to smoke, the eye, the temple. Bladder and intestinal have surgery. The greatest thing that happened to her night was surgery in the lower abdomen. It's performed. Everybody say, surgery success. Hallelujah. Be free in both your legs. Jesus name. What do you feel in your legs? Father. Can you feel any pain in your legs now whatsoever? No. Yes, sure. Yeah. We're just stiffening your spine. Back in the lower abdomen, see the surgery took. Now listen, before you leave me, I got one more prayer to pray with God physical, but it's spiritual and it's for your soul. Yeah. You want God to take care of your soul? Throw your hands up and give it to God then. I pray this prayer with me, dear Jesus. Pray with me, dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Take my soul. Take my soul. I turn it over to you. Turn it over to you. Wash me in the blood. Cleanse me from all sin. Cleanse me from all sin. I repent of all sin today. I shall be baptized. I shall be baptized. I shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. I shall go to church. I shall endure unto the end. That's the person who will be saved. I'm God's property now. I've started for heaven by faith. Put my name in your book. Take care of me, Lord. Everybody thank God for a new soul. God's property, I claim it for eternity. Hallelujah to God. Coming out of you now, you ready? Yeah. Well, this is your nicotine spirit. Be gone from her thin body, lungs, and postal. This is on our own fear. That's for your boundary. No. Everybody said it's gone. Take a taste. Can you taste any nicotine flavor? Try again and be very sure. I do not want to be guilty of leaving the witness. Oh, so? Mm-hmm. That's been a sign for over 20 years in that crusade of deliverance from the cigarette habit is when God took the taste of the nicotine. I'll take a boot breath before you leave me. 
There's another sign that works in this ministry. I believe in signs. Following the believer. That's true if you're a believer in signs. Something brand new and clean. Lay down deep inside your soul. That's not just a feeling. That's a person who just moves in and his name is Jesus. Upon the confession of your faith, salvation has begun. I underline begun. The technical folk. Mm-hmm. I want you to run down here. I'll tell you the lie to all.